This video is sponsored by Skillshare. The first 500 people to use the link in the description get their first two months free. This is Dubai, one of seven monarchies which form the United Arab Emirates. And this is the world, a 300 island archipelago right off its coast. There's an island for almost everyone but Israel, including California, Antarctica, even North Korea. You know, for anyone just dying to visit. So why draw the world with 300 million cubic meters of sand? Well, why drive million dollar police cars? Or build a tower so tall you can watch the sunset right to the top and watch it again? Why build a ski resort in the middle of the desert? Because, well, because they're cool. It probably sounds familiar. A country discovers it's sitting on black gold, and its royalty becomes unbelievably rich, while the average person can barely eat. But not quite. Dubai does have oil, but today it only accounts for less than 1% of its GDP. What looks like pure extravagance is actually pure marketing genius, attracting 14 million international visitors a year who spend more than any other city in the world, 65% more even than New York or London. The Burj Al Arab Hotel, for example, only has 200 rooms, each two stories tall. It wasn't built to make a profit it, but draw travelers with deep pockets. To its neighbors, Dubai is progressive and modern. To others, it's very traditional and religious. It's the pinnacle of luxury, yet many are enslaved, living on next to nothing. So how did Dubai become such an exception? Geography is the recipe for civilization. It decides where people can go and what they can build. That's what makes Dubai so remarkable. It's the last place you'd want to found your city. The obvious reason is climate, which ranges from arid desert to unbearably arid desert. The part of Australia even it kinda just gave up on. And that's, well, that's it. It rains a whole five days a year, with 106 degree days and 88 degree nights. During the winter, it drops all the way to a freezing cold 77 degrees. Next, agriculture, or lack thereof. Because less than 1% of the country's land is arable, only a third of which is irrigated. Large portions are covered in a salty crust called sabka, making it less than useless for growing anything but league players. And the entire 3.2 million square kilometer peninsula lacks a single natural river. The United States, in comparison, has 250,000. 98.8% of Dubai's water has to be pumped from the Persian Gulf and desalinated. Okay, so terrible climate plus poor agriculture plus no source of water equals major international city? Let's rewind. Before it had armies, borders, or diplomacy, Dubai was ruled by tribes called sheikdoms. Until the early 1800s, when pirates in the Gulf did the unthinkable. They got between Britain and its tea, attacking its valuable trade route with India. Now the region had strategic value, and the English an excuse to plant their flag. The last thing they wanted was another tea affair. You know, you go easy on them, and next thing you know, they want fair and equal representation. That's no good. So they proposed a truce, stop stealing our tea and we'll protect your territory. Oh, and P.S. We're the captain now. The British settled disagreements between chiefdoms, now called the Trucial States, and they promised not to work with any other country, which put them in a strange position. On one hand, the tribes were isolated from the world. With Britain as a barrier, they struggled to trade or grow or develop. But it also gave them incredible stability, the first pillar of Dubai's success. Not a single leader has been overthrown since. And to this day, whenever there's violence or chaos in the world, investors turn to Dubai for a safe place to put their money. 9-11, for example, should have been terrible for its economy. Two of the attackers were from the country, and its banks were used to launder money. But when the US responded with the Patriot Act, it scared away Arab investors who went from pumping 25 billion a year into the US economy to only 1.2. All that money was looking for safety, and Dubai was the answer. The ultimate test of stability was the Arab Spring, with protests in Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Libya, Syria, Kuwait, Yemen, well, all these countries. 
but not the Emirates, who sat with their toes in the sand sipping a cocktail, while their neighbors used a different kind of cocktail. They escaped revolution because of their unusual social structure. North Korea maintains stability not because it has the resources to keep people happy, but because it doesn't need to. Everyone is either too preoccupied to revolt or too isolated to know. Dubai is the opposite. It leaves no reason to revolt. Citizens get free land, water, education, healthcare, and subsidized electricity, food, gas, and weddings. It can afford this without the T word by carefully managing its citizenship. 85% of the population are expats, compared to, say, America's 14. You may have been born in Dubai, you may have lived there 50 years, but you're almost certainly never becoming a citizen. The second pillar is commerce. In 1971, the British decided they had bigger fish and chips to fry, leaving the tribes to fend for themselves. But Iran, you know, not wanting them to get lonely, swooped in on the very last day before they left, capturing several islands. The British cared about as much as a senior on their last day of school. But when ships arrived on the third island, one of the tribes had an idea. Hey, looks like you're admiring this lovely beachfront property here. Can we lease it to you for three million? The Iranians agreed and put away the weapons they had, for some reason, taken to look at real estate. The seven tribes became seven emirates, forming the country we know today. And their spirit of business continued. When Iran increased its taxes, Dubai lowered its own and gave free land to any company willing to move. Today, Dubai attracts businesses with special economic zones, like Science Park and Media City, which has become the Middle Eastern hub for journalists, and in the process, given Dubai lots of free press. Each zone has different laws, a British court system, and uses American dollars. They're almost different countries. But even more important in Dubai's plan to replace oil is tourism. Long ago, the pearl industry constituted 95% of the Gulf economy, until the Japanese developed artificially cultured versions, devastating Dubai's only income. But it learned the lesson, never rely on just one resource. So when it discovered oil in 1966, Dubai invested the money in roads, factories, ports, and state-run businesses. Before it could become a tourist destination, it needed a way to get people there. Luckily, Dubai has a natural advantage, conveniently located between Europe and Asia, Africa, and Australia. It began with British airplanes refueling on their way to India, Imperial Airways paying about $150 a month for landing rights. But Dubai knew it could do better. First, it opened its skies to any airline that would come. Later, when Gulf Air dropped 45 of its weekly flights, Dubai decided it needed an airline of its own. And that's when it really took off. Today, Dubai's is the busiest international airport in the world, and Emirates the fourth largest airline by distance traveled. Dubai has plenty of challenges ahead, but with these three pillars, it's well prepared for a world without oil. Its leaders understand the power of diversifying your skill set, and so should you and I. With Skillshare, you can learn and master all kinds of creative and professional skills that will help you do just that. I've created my own course for anyone interested in learning how to make animated videos like this one. I go over the research, writing, animation, everything you need to make a YouTube video from start to finish. And what's awesome is that in the process, you're actually learning many different things. Creative writing, professional research, graphic design, and more. I've included practice files with the course so you can easily follow along. Maybe you're more interested in photography or investing, and Skillshare has those too. A premium membership gives you unlimited access to all of them, so you can learn as much as you want and when you have time. But the first 500 people to use the link in the description get two months free, so you can watch my course and any number of others at absolutely no cost. Thanks to Skillshare for supporting this show, and to you for listening.